So, hi, Grace. Thanks for um, talking with me today. Um, you know, I think our work that we've done together over the years and the work that we've done separately, I, I feel like this is going to be a really good conversation. So maybe we could start with, um, if you could introduce yourself and tell people about like the work that you do, what you're into. Uh, thanks so much, Bryce, for this opportunity. It's really cool. And I'm really glad I could spend some time doing this uh, with you. And I think this topic's really important. So I'm Grace Jun. I am an assistant professor at the University of Georgia, previously at Parsons School of Design. And my research focus is around design and disability and how to bring in collaboration with people with disabilities, uh, whether it's on aging or looking at design in a new way that's more accessible. Um, previously, uh, I had been part of Samsung Electronics and I had worked in the tech industry. So a lot of my UX background transfers to the methods and approaches I use in my classroom. I'm also a board member at a nonprofit called Open Style Lab, um, which was started at MIT in 2014. And it's a women-led nonprofit that makes style accessible for all people uh, to be more inclusive. And specifically, um, we create educational programs to equip community, uh, to collaborate with different disability organizations and schools uh, to make accessible clothing, products, or tools. And each summer we've been hosting programs like that. Yeah, very cool. And we, we met years ago when you um, and Christina came to visit our first version of the lab. I'm in the second version of the lab. And since then, we've collaborated on um, a couple of things. One of the things that we collaborated on was this, what became the Surface Adaptive Kit. You know, you were part of the initial kind of brainstorming of that because, you know, we wanted to make sure that, that people had, people with disabilities had premium products really in a lot of ways and, and had something that actually felt good. Um, I always joke in here that my biggest competitor is duct tape and cardboard. Um, you know, uh, so we're always kind of struggling to create these, like these experiences for people that, that feel just like any other premium consumer product. Um, and so, yeah, your work has always really inspired us there. The work that open style lab did with um, Ikea was, was kind of why we, we contacted you. Um, so that was a, a very cool collaboration. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm really hoping to kind of talk, get into as we, as we sort of talk about this is I'm, I'm not a fashion guy, I'm, I'm, an, you know, I'm an old guy, <laughs> you know, but I really appreciate the, just sort of the norms uh, and the expectations around crafting an outfit. Like you don't, you don't have an outfit that's just one thing, right? And any, and I mean this about anybody, like you can add a jacket, you can change your shoes, you can accessorize and you can make your outfit fit the context that you're in. And I, I'm always really inspired by that. And I don't know why, whenever we talk about things like that around other products and disability, it feels so foreign, right? Where it's like an out in, in clothing, it's just completely natural. Yeah, I mean, it's fundamental thing to get dressed every morning. You know, it's like food, getting dressed, having um, shelter. And it's still not accessible for many people, and especially people with disabilities. And so I really loved how, I, especially the work that I've seen around this grow over the last decade, um, has kind of coincidentally worked along with technology and product. And it's very culturally sensitive. So like fashion becomes a vehicle for self-expression. It's an embodiment in a material sense of culture and societal values. And it also is material. It's like made of uh, fabric, sometimes things that are not yeah. fabric <laughs> in terms of wearable technologies today. Um, and sometimes in between, whether they are more closer to the body. And I see that sometimes with prosthetics or um, adaptations to the body. Uh, which are on the borderline of, is it functional yet stylish? And is it functioning only as uh, maybe a piece of medical equipment or is it a fashion item? And so that kind of boundary, I 100% agree, is like a really exciting space. See that 
innovation and adaptation also translated a lot in technology and products today. Yeah, I mean, that medical stigma is really interesting, right? I think like when, when, when the adaptive controller came out, we knew we were, at, we were trying to create a consumer grade product. We didn't, and, and we were trying not to stigmatize. We were really thinking about that a lot, but I don't know. I don't, we were still new to it, right? We were still new to this idea that the stigma of medical equipment is really strong. And, and the way that we sort of talk about it in here in the inclusive tech lab is like, okay, well, you know, at one time wearing glasses was medically stigmatizing and now glasses are part of every outfit. And when will we get there for hearing aids and canes and other types of, and, and as you said, prosthetics too. Yeah, I think there's a really lovely transformation. Even in U.S. history, I'm looking at um, adaptive tools that are borderline fashion as well. And it's not something that's foreign because even if you look at Optor, um, it's supposed to be highly customized to your body or the clientele's body. Um, it also probably is not always functional, <laughs> depending on how long the train is or how it's worn. Um, but it definitely stands for something. And making clothing more accessible, I feel like is almost the most highly customized form or augmentation of clothing you right. can get. And so if we kind of view it in that perspective, and yes, uh, cost-friendly, perhaps that would be one way to be more inclusive in the things we do. But tailoring has such a huge history, especially post-war. And I immediately think about the other scholars before me who really looked at why am I a size four in Gap, but I'm a size six in like Zara. And it doesn't make sense, but because of the standardization of sizing from post-war, especially for uniforms, um, different types were just not considered. And I think with gaming and especially with controllers, now we're considering a bit more about how the body progresses, how people use different ways of um, you know, gaming and experience gaming. And I think that's the same way clothing is probably having to change as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think... That's so fascinating. You just tied like haute couture to like the standardization of, <laughs> of military sizing, which is, which is, I mean, I, I, I love it. I get it. You know, um, for people who might not know the standardization of military sizing, you know, was basically the, the origins of, of trying to create the average person, right? And how <laughs> before that, everything, like you said, was tailored, right? So, you know, the reality is, is, you know, studies have shown in lots of, for over many, many years that no one fits the average person. Everyone always sort of falls out of it in some way or another. So that last sort of mile of tailoring is, is really important. I mean, I think, I know in our practice, we were really inspired by the word fit. and We talk about fit a lot. We think about, you know, that fit and as an industrial designer, uh, I must admit, I, I often like to say, uh, for me, I, I go, the fit is the finish in many ways, right? Like, because it, we're not done until, until this thing can kind of fit. But at the same time, we're living in a world, you know, to, to bring it back to, to fashion, you know, yes, things can be customizable, but people want that stuff that's off the runway. Like they want to be able to go get it, right? <laughs> And so how do we think about mass manufacturing and this idea of fit? Yeah, and I think it's a continuing area of research for many scholars. Um, I just came back from the ITAA. Oh, it's interesting. International cool. South oh, sorry, different one. Uh, funny. There's a, sh there's a show in Florida right now called the ITIA, ITIA which, which which I got that mixed up in my head which is the Assistive Technology Industry Association show. I was like, oh, you were there, but no, you were at a different way. <laughs> Maybe we'll just there too. Um, but it's, I think uh, it's such a conversation that I'm so glad I'm having with you because the more and more you have conversations with people between textiles, material sciences, fashion, and assistive mm -hmm. technology and product, those barriers that we kind of all recognize and also opportunity areas become a lot more clear and concise. Uh, whereas I feel like we're all saying kind of right. the same thing. Like why is the products that either we wear, the things that we use are not becoming more adaptable for our uh, lives as we progress in different stages or through aging. 
And it's simple as like, you know, I'm, I'm not a person with a disability, but I do um, have started an organization for people with disabilities. And I've had several temporary disabilities throughout my life. And I could only imagine I had to change my garments to fit to me because <laughs> I couldn't get dressed. Um, and this was with an accident and things like that. But as your body changes, it's only, I think, fair to say your environment, you know, your built environment and your products, especially something as close to your skin, can change. And probably you feel that impact closer because everyone gets dressed yeah. in the morning to try to get up. Yeah. It's really cool. And I mean, I, I think so many things that I, I think we could kind of talk about. Um, there is one thing that I wonder if you encounter the same thing that, that I encounter, which is, um, you know, even though there are people that have like these great, like adaptability and, and tailoring needs, there's just something in our modern culture that that where people assume that they buy it and then if they, if it doesn't work for them, they just send it back. Right. Like, like there's just this, there is no real notion I think of, of, of being able to customize, I guess, in a way, I mean, um, to tell you a story of prosthetics, right? Like there's a, there's a charity called, um, limitless. I'm um, down in Florida and they make 3d printed arms for people. And they run across this problem, which is just like they, they give someone an arm and if it doesn't work perfectly, like right away, they just abandon it. You know, and you see that a lot in assistive technology. You see it all over the place. The abandonment rate of assistive technology is really high. And it's one of those things that in, in my industry that we're trying to figure out like what, like, cause it's not always because you do wonder if it's a cultural problem. Like you do wonder if it's basically like, like with the adaptive controller, we, when it came out, we met people who never even considered gaming, let alone how they could adapt gaming to work for them. So they were, we were starting from, we, we, we thought zero was here and zero was really down here. Like we were starting from like this place of like, where people just didn't even have the, the, the awareness that it was even possible. Yeah, I think uh, what you're touching upon is like adaptation or adoption of like different types of things in fashion, especially clothing and any product is such an example, like fast fashion is the result of people not taking care of clothes that they no longer want, whether they just bought it yesterday. And so I think there's really um, a great opportunity for design affordances to retain things that you care about. And I see glimpses of this in sustainability, also in fashion, uh, when you repurpose things um, and materials, uh, give it a second life. And I think with a newer generation, like kind of a patch up of, you know, 90s clothing has been really fashionable and speaks to the culture and society today for the youth. But there really is, a, I think, a great opportunity to look at design affordances. And that's a lot of the work that I've been doing as a researcher, but also through Style Labs program is like not just making something functional, but how do you make it desirable? How do you make it something that you want so bad right. to keep? And it's not just because it fits to you only or um, it covers you and it protects you, but there is something that's a, a bit of that cultural desirability that I think fashion does so well. It's really interesting because I think, I think for me, when you're saying like desirability, I mean, I, I get it. And I think of trying to apply that to the work that I do, I think about like, I want people to engage like with us and with like, you know, we're, we're in this together, right? Like this isn't something I just send you and then you go away, right? Like how do we start to build communities of practice? How do we start to build um, just, just this sort of, like you said, like culture around um, wanting to kind of make things like fit. It's really interesting. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I remember at open style lab one summer, we had donate, had a donation of dead stock from a performance fabric company and they had no use for it. They had like, I think less than 10 yards. Um, and they couldn't sell it because it wasn't enough to sell in bulk. And we took that on. We we're like, that would be a perfect rain jacket for someone who was using a wheelchair. 
And I thought about many of my friends who have spinal cord injury where I'm like, that performance material that's 100% waterproof would go a long way. And in that sense, you're looking at opportunity from a material that can be transformed into a garment and hopefully retained and beloved by the person who's wearing it. Um, I believe most of the people who made the garment together had a little bit more of an attachment sense because we have that program. And so it's not just like, here's a rain jacket, we're done, and that's a product. But they went through 10 weeks with the Open Style Lab team to design this jacket together. Uh, and so I think that probably brings some level of desirability and attachment to something you create. And maybe the creation activity is something I see in my students is when you make something, you automatically, whether you hate it or not, <laughs> or uh, don't think it's perfect, it is still part of something that you've expressed. And so I do think that brings um, a little bit more of the affordances and of course, adaptability to keep it. Yeah, it's so cool. And I mean, it's really interesting you talking about material um, because it's just honestly, like, I mean, I, I've been in accessibility for a long time and we don't talk about material. Like we don't talk about the attributes of material. Um, you know, there's so much of classic, I think accessibility. So, um, my old boss, August de Los Reyes used to talk about, um, accessibility the difference between what he saw accessibility and inclusive design and, and you know i that really made a, a impression on me which was you know accessibility is this clinical kind of engineering practice there's a barrier how do you overcome said barrier like how do you, you know, problem solution problem solution and i i think as we as we delve into sort of more modern and broader views of what disability is it's not as cut and dry as there's a barrier, right? Like the mismatches that people have can be, can be really, you know, can be a lot more amorphous. I, I'm assuming that the, the raincoat that you made was lovely and that before you made it, like, what did that person do? Like, I'm trying to, I'm strangely imagining like things that were, are tarp like, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, um, I think they were that person is my friend Q Kumal, who was wearing, I think, a Gore-Tex jacket, and he said it was getting him right. hot, like unbelievably hot. And so this is where it's like it's not about just the design or the function, but the actual composition of how all of those things come to play that brings breathability, yeah. protection, uh, so honors the material constraints that you were. Did the garment cover the chair at all? I think, um, no, but there was a flap that helped kind of, you know, if you look at a vent flap from yeah. a rain jacket, that kind of naturally, because there was a dart, the rain poured cool. away from Cause I, I, you know, cause that's really interesting. That must be interesting in your work when you talk about like when, when assistive technology and these augmentations become part of the person. Right. Um, and I'm not, you know, necessarily suggesting this with your friend, but like, you know, like an, an example, like if you've got a, someone who's wearing hearing aids, um, they're, they're, they're really part of their body. They don't want to, they don't want to, um, they don't want to part with them. When I was in gaming, I would get a lot of requests for, because people would see their, their favorite streamers and they'd be wearing these big chunky headphones. Right. And they're like, I want those headphones, but I need my hearing aids to work through. Them. And I'm like, Ooh, that's, you know. You know, you, you're stacking electronics on electronics. People wanted what they wanted, right? Like they wanted to project an image. They wanted to emulate like the people that they admired. So, you know, we, we, we come across that a lot in our work, which, which is completely understandable, but I just feel like at another point in accessibility, it would have been like, no, you can't have what you want because this is what you need. Right. And, and now we're at a point where we are trying to give people what they want and what they need. <laughs> yeah, and it's a difficult position. It's a question I get a lot is how do you mass produce this? How does right. everyone have this? And my answer to that really is like, there's so many different types of approaches, business models today that are just about mass manufacturing and like slow fashion and slow customization tailoring has been 
a big thing for smaller businesses. And I've seen that with some graduates from design schools um, in fashion in particular, but also kind of just thinking about how it impacts um, operation as a whole, right? You know, you're not just producing quickly and you are considering uh, collaborating with people, um, having it more inclusive and therefore you're tailoring that experience together. And, and I mean, that's wonderful. And I want to, I wouldn't mind touching on mass manufacturing though. Um, I have a lot of feelings about it as well, right? Like, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's fair to say that assuming that mass manufacturing is the norm that gets us into a lot of these problems of, of things not fitting. Right. Um, right. So, but I do, I do wonder about economies of scale, right? Um, when I see engineers, when I see engineering students try to tackle the cost problem, they, they think about, they think about like filament cost of a 3d printer, like young engineering students will think about that to the point where I've seen people 3D print headbands, like, you know, and they said, well, this only costs this much in filament. And I'm like, yeah, but you could buy headbands by the truckload. Like, you know, like, so how do you take things that exist already? Or how do you, how do you think of these systems in a way that, okay, well, yes, I want something tailored, but that doesn't mean that everything has to be made from scratch. Right. And I think they're, like I mentioned about the material opportunity, things are there. And sometimes I felt the best design opportunities come from constraint or from things that are already something you can work with. Uh, just takes a bit more time to look for them. <laughs> and I feel like that's part of making connections, right? Like I would have never learned the things I have if I haven't talked to those manufacturing companies. Um, if I didn't talk to an occupational therapist, uh, a disability scholar. Like I think all of those kind of connect to meeting a system and to help create, you know, opportunities where small systems can thrive and therefore we can address more people. It's really cool. Can I ask, um, so we've worked together, you've worked in tech, you've worked in fashion. Is there any other field that you really can draw inspiration from? Um, I, I think a lot about the built yeah, environment. I even though like, oh, yeah. even though I'm not really a built environment person, I think about it a lot. Yeah. I mean, I think you can't, I mean, I come from a graphic design background and right now I'm teaching a little bit about user experience and fundamentals and principles of graphic design. But a lot of that came from looking at, for example, the first icon that was kind of developed um, for the wheelchair user. And when I see that it was in the context of, the rise of universal design and thinking of spaces to be more aware of like, how do we utilize the space? How do we identify people? Um, and seeing a pictogram suddenly translate with bodily posture that that's associated to disability. And so the built environment, I feel like has a great um, extension about how we can look at the body and how we can look at products. Cause you see something as intimate as the skin. Sometimes you have electronics on the skin now as like stickers that I've seen researchers do, and then you have some things that are worn, uh, and then you have things that are products or sometimes even parts of your body, uh, whether it's for amputees or hearing aids. Uh, and then we have the space that we're living in. And sometimes in convergence, they come all together. <laughs> and I remember like a decade ago when I was working in tech, they were talking about IoT and machine learning. And I was like, great, but what are we going to use this right. for? <laughs> And I think that's always the question I keep asking with any new technology or new material that comes out is, what is its application uh, and who needs this? Um, not only for business, but really out of like um, use case and therefore keeping peace closer to you. And I, and I always, I'm always apprehensive of, I mean, especially in tech of these like, these people that are going to say, well, we're going to fix this. You're not, this is not going to be a problem in the future. I'm going to put a chip in your brain and you're going to be able to like do whatever you want. Know. And, and we get a lot of questions like that in here. Um, I definitely tend to just because of the people that I've engaged with and the, the work that we've done, I, I tend to, to be a little bit more pragmatic, 
I guess about it. You know, again, like, you know, I can talk to someone with muscular dystrophy who wants to play video games and they're like, I need a light joystick. And I'm like, you should use not a joystick. You should use something else besides a joystick because, you know, joysticks have springs in them and that can be hard for you. And they're like, but joysticks are gaming and that's what I want. <laughs> you know, right. And so it is always that kind of push and pull. Oops, my lights went off. I'm going to have to just jump around for a minute. It's an amazing space. Thank you. <laughs> you, you I, it'll, it'd be great to have you come by the new one. Um, you know, we've had a, we've had a good one. We've had a good one. But yeah, I mean, th those types of, I guess it's back to need and want and things like that. You know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned the space because there's one thing, you know, like behind me is, is our sensory area. We've always had it, you know, we've, we're, we don't really know what we're doing with it. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that it's this, like, it's always this exploratory kind of thing and people come in and really gravitate towards it. So you know, when you're thinking about accessibility as like a, well, you know, like as a, like as a clinical medical, get over the barriers thing. And then you talk about desirability, right? You know, I have neurodiverse individuals that come in here and ignore it, like anything that I'm saying or whatever, they're jumping in there. It's like, that's, and, and that is what it's for. Right. And so how do we, how do we learn from that different type of desirability you know, for, for certain individuals. And, and when it, and it does come back to material. a lot. So I, I suspect that in your work, um, and I don't know if you have any stories, like the one story that you had about the, that material and how you used it is cool. I'm trying to think of, I, I'm assuming you might have a story about someone who just wants something that feels a certain way because it makes them feel good. All yeah. the time. I think it's, it's like, I want this kind of jumpsuit, but we're like, okay, you want it lace, but it's going to probably cause a pressure sore. Okay. And we'd have to compromise. And this is where I feel really um, having something collaborative uh, is really hard to accomplish. And I think people think of collaboration as there's only one type of way where everything's always equitable, but there's a really great way to look at it as every individual there is bringing their expertise in something. So even back to the joystick issue, you know, you've been working with probably controllers for a long time. And you're like, that spring, it's not going to be the best alternative. Anything with me, when I look at a certain silhouette, I'm like, that is not going to bend. Like, it's not going to be flexible for the portion that that person wants on their body, unless it's this type right. of XYZ fat, or it's constructed in this type of way. And I think that's important when you talk with different diverse communities, whether we're thinking about race or ability. And I think anyway, they're bringing their expertise yeah. as well. And so it has to be kind of a compromise. And that's where I feel like a lot of my collaborations has been is like a lot of yeah. talking about, okay, you know this part, I know this part. How do we not put it together <laughs> and make something, who is making the thing? How do we make that process also um, as collaborative as possible? And I think it's, there's never a cookie cutter or a one side yeah. at all type of, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, that's, that sounds a lot like what we try to preach in here and practice in here is, you know, people with disabilities are the experts in their own experiences. You know, absolutely. Um, but it's a mistake to have, to put them in necessarily in the role of designer when they're not trained as a designer. Right. And yeah, they are great. And, it, and it's, and it's not like they're not collaborators either. I guess what I mean by that is is I will work with like people who are uncomfortable around disability, like my peers mm -hmm. and they will meet someone with disabilities. And that person will say, I need this, this, and this, and that, that veteran product maker basically throws out all of their experience and goes, cause they want to do the right thing and they'll go, okay, I'll go do that. And, and I have to slow them down and go, you only talk to this one person. <laughs> you know, right. And, you know, and, and you also have expertise in, in, in a bunch of different things. So, so I think, I think that collaboration part that we're talking about really does, it needs to be deeper on all sides. Like, you know, it's not just, you know, nothing about us without us, you know, doesn't mean that doesn't mean go do exactly what they want. Right. <laughs> you know, 
or what they're telling you because what yeah. they're telling you might not be what they want. <laughs> I think there's a difference. What you're saying is that um, in difference between inclusion and actually being collaborative, right? right? As you've got the inclusion part, I highly agree with that because I mean, people have different skill sets and we should honor that in that process, um, but also be mindful. And I think we're already there at many phases. I see so many companies championing more inclusive practices and having people in meetings and in projects. Um, and hope that doesn't just end. Yeah. <laughs> but that already is the first step. And then I think the second step would be to honor each other's different expertise and skill sets. And um, one thing that really struck me and when I was working at Open Style Lab, they had a toolkit that was designed with um, the young teen girls at NYU for their women's initiatives, for women's with disabilities team. And we got to the conversation about, okay, let's co-design clothing together. And I recall, hey, there's no accessible sewing needle, right? Like there's no stencils to be able to describe the type of body or style you want. And I realized at that point we had to take a step back and instead of putting our assumptions, really look to meet at a plane where we could have a conversation that's more collaborative. And the girls had a lot of opinions. And so they're like, yeah, let's make an adaptive sewing toolkit because I want to learn how to make my own pocket accessible. And it was a pretty big awakening moment for me to know that it's not just about the end goal, but like, what are the steps that'll get you there? And how do we make that uh, more of a equal playing ground so people could contribute their skills uh, to work together? But it's, totally. it's interesting, right? Because I think what you're describing is the making of tools. And, you know, I mean, I work at Microsoft. We, we basically make tools. Like, you know, people talk about them in a lot of different oh. ways. But fundamentally, the vast majority of, of, I think, what we make and what we've been known for is we're, we're tool makers. Um, so it is, so experiencing our products is making an accessible tool, if that makes sense. <laughs> so, you know, it's, so it's, it, that part's kind of interesting, I think. That's really cool. Very cool. Wow. So this has been really, really cool. I just wondering, is there anything you want to touch on that we haven't touched on? Um, I think we touched on a lot of topics, but I, I'm most excited for my upcoming book called Fashion Disability Very and Co-Design. Cool. Wow. A shout out. Um, it's been published by Bloomsbury in May. And so about the co collaborations, that was exactly what I was trying to show examples of to many of my students. And I think that has been really hard for me to see uh, in terms of resources. So I hope that book really portrays and honors all of the collaborations um, that myself and many others, whether alumni or uh, disability experts and material sciences and engineers came together to make. But they all have pictures too, which makes me thrilled. And there'll be a digital accessible version, hopefully by the end of this year. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, good. But, yeah, and I hope there can be more collaborations after that to not just see I guess like a discipline in its way, having its honored space, right? Fashion as fashion, but it has so much opportunity to extend to other spaces, like the conversation we're having. Well, and yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's interesting. I, I again, I'm I'm not in your space. No, I'm only. Uh, I I remember the documentary, and I can't remember the Target documentary. Um, what what's that called right now? Oh, right. And for I, all, you know, yeah. I, I was, I pointed people to that for a really long time. I mean, I still do, you know, if anyone asks. Um, so I, I think about like the kind of ebbs and flows, like in our industry, like, so, you know, we make progress and then it might not seem like we're doing a lot, but that's because like, you're, you're kind of working in another place. So like, you know, maybe, maybe one day you're producing you're producing clothing and the next day you're working on like accessible tools, right? So one's facing one way and one's facing another. And so people don't always see um, the, the sort of steady uptick that they expect to see from the thing. Do you feel good about where, um, where the like fashion industry is headed? Well, I think the conversation is always ongoing, just like you said. And, 
it has its dips and then it comes back. It has its critics. It has its supporters. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think having a continual conversation is really the first step of being collaborative in any way, especially if someone's missing from that conversation. And then having ways to kind of relook at it as a, for me personally, a design opportunity and seeing it as a creative opportunity. I think it's something that excites people um, instead of, uh, I think it's like, oh, we have to do this or people need this, but can we be excited about this together? I think it's really the goal. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think there's so much of that that's missing, I think, from the accessibility world is that excitement. Right? Like there's, we're so it's often, it often just feels like, you know, complaints department all the time. And, and, you know, and that's, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to dishonor, like, like those complaints are valid, hundred percent valid. I, but I do think that like for us to move forward, we do need new ways of, of dealing with it. So, yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you so much for this conversation. So good. Well, sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, no. It's really great. I was just kind of touching upon the educational aspect and why what we're doing is important in the first place, because more people have to know like what that's like on also the Microsoft side. Um, a lot of people, why aren't there more accessible clothes? And I was like, if you only knew what it was like to manufacture, produce yarn, and then get the labor right. force, make it a sustainable system, you might consider rephrasing that question. And so I, I see that the same way in technology and um and I hope that there's more people that would be willing to maybe uh, expand on that education and raising awareness to see both yeah. sides of various skills and systems. We, um, we try really hard here to encourage people, like lots of people want to get into this work, but it's not their day jobs. So we, we try really hard to support their desire to kind of get into this work. But at the same time, you know, they, they do have to, you know, they, it's work. They still have to kind of dig in there. We're not running. Like I, I struggle with a lot of things for a long time. When I would talk to, to teams internally, I'd get a lot of like, um, what you're doing is so inspiring. It makes me so proud to work here, which is, you know, you can cringe about whatever, you know, we don't, that word inspiration in the, in the disability community means lots of things, but I think, I think, you know, people genuinely felt like true, genuine emotion and you can't deny people's emotions. People feel what they feel. It's not right or wrong, just is. But I I do try to, when people say things like that, I try to go, okay, now take that inspiration and turn it into motivation and go do something like, like, you know, it's great that you think that the work that we did is great. Thank you, but go do something, <laughs> you know, right? So that's that's what we try to yeah. try to focus around here, and it's tricky, right? Oh, it's, it's like the same in the nonprofit world. They're like, bless right. your heart, you're doing something so kind and generous. And I was like, that's not really the purpose of what we're doing. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, if you want to volunteer, you can start with setting up the table. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> getting a wheelchair accessible, you know, like entryway <laughs> ready. No. Yeah, no, it's just, it's so funny. Like it's, I, I get it. It's just, it's, it's just interesting how, you know, no, we're, we're in this, like we're, you know, I mean, I always take inspiration from like Stella Young, you know, inspiration porn and all that work was, was great. Um, I have a picture of her that I used to have on my desktop for a long time. Um, and it's, it's, she's wearing a t-shirt that says, uh, I think it says inspiration boner killer, which I thought is just like, oh, it's just perfect, <laughs> you, know? you know, in so many ways, because I think, you know, like w- with one of the things that, you know, that whole bless your heart thing, um, one of the things that we did with the adaptive controller, one of the the ads that we did for it, that didn't get as much press as I hoped, but it's, it's still my favorite is we, um, we did, we did, a we did like this video with comedian Zach Anner, um, who has cerebral palsy and 
you know, he normally, he sometimes gets his, his own content is very edgy, but when he does content for other people, he was like, is this for kids or adults? And I was like, hard adult, like, like we don't want, this isn't for kids. Right. And in the content that he made, you know, he showed like, he's a gamer and he can be a jerk and you know, just, it was just wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, that whole side of the, the community is, is really tricky when you're in and when you're out, I guess. Yeah. And the relatability to it. Um, but also if people say it's inspiration or bless your heart, I feel like what gets lost in a lot of writing or social media or on the web is the intentionality mm -hmm. of the person. If you really are speaking to them, you can tell like, I know what you said might sound cringe, but you really yeah. meant it. And we sh we try to yeah. work together. And so if sometimes people could forget that if they just see that. I, I had to learn that lesson, you know, after the, the, the controller Super Bowl ad, people would come up to me for months and be like, oh, that ad made me cry. And I literally would roll my eyes in their face. And then I realized that I was the bad guy. You know, that, you know, yeah, people, people have every right to feel what they want to feel or what they feel. <laughs> yeah, and maybe sometimes it's the lack of words or at the moment, right. but some people really know well and they really want to be involved. And I'm sure with the lab and with other opportunities to learn more. And it's one of the reasons why Open Style exists because I didn't see a space like that uh, to give that kind of learning experience. There was always so much red tape every organization had their own styled form of activities. And so it wasn't, I thought, interdisciplinary or collaborative enough or multi-generational kind of way to integrate people. So, I mean, that's, sorry, I know we were wrapping up and then I'm diving back in here. Um, but, you know, that's really interesting to, to sort of think about um, what, how do you balance because I, I I have these balances, I'm sure you do too. Like there's doing work like with your nonprofit to sort of uplift the community and to sort of like you know ra rise everybody up, versus like focusing on the problems and the challenges that you want to to do. So like for, for an example, you know I work at Microsoft. I get asked a lot about like um, disability employee um, employee resource groups, and they're important. They're super important here at Microsoft and they're really rich and they're wonderful, but I kind of leave them to other people so that I can focus on product. Um, and you know, it's, it's really just kind of picking your lane, but you have to figure out, you know, but, but the work we do in the lab is, is culture building. So it's sort of like that. So it's, you know, how do you do that? Do you feel like that makes sense? Yeah. I like that with your work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there were moments of how do we hire or integrate and pay people with disabilities in our work and the nonprofit structure has been given so much more flexibility for um, myself and the board and the team to exercise that. But even in academia, it wasn't always the case. And so I think that took a lot of hard effort for me to try to work with someone who was in charge of bringing guests, right? With guests, there's liability in a space. There's like all these other red tape things and the door is too heavy. It's not accessible, but you're having a guest speaker who has a disability. And it's just all these other things where um, I've kind of experienced in the teaching realm, but you got to start somewhere. And, you know, I think having small conversations uh, to be able to highlight important work where if it's someone in HR, you just pull them in and be like, I need you for this specific project out of all the other projects we've ever done at the lab. But we really need to hire, you know, a person with a disability. Like, I really needed to have an expert who was disabled to be able to give the first speech at the class. And so wanted to honor that. They're like, oh, we don't have resources. I was like, great, I'm going to go get a grant. And then here's the resources. You go fill out the paperwork. And we got that person in after like three months, <laughs> which took a long time before the semester. But I, I totally understand that side of operations, getting all the pieces together and like making sure you're not overstepping also someone else's responsibilities and to be able to do that together is really hard to set that atmosphere in that space. 